successor. And for a couple of years, we met every other week and tried to forge, you know, what would be, uh, what turned out to be a uh, new transportation policy uh, in 1991, so something called ICE-T, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, but took a couple of years to kind of get everybody on the same page and forge a consensus so that when it got into the political process in Washington, in Congress, and between Congress and all the interest groups, that, that the transportation interests were speaking more or less with one voice because they tried it a couple times before without success. And uh, as a result of that effort, I was asked to join the administration, which was the first Bush administration, as a head of policy uh, in the Federal Highway Administration. And I spent four years converting this consensus, trying to convert this consensus into, into a new transportation policy and program, and eventually it happened. And then I, after that, I left and, and came back into consulting, but I gradually moved more and more away from the sort of planning and design and the projects and facilities world into uh, ITS and uh, operations and so on, and, and basically thinking about how we could get uh, a better level of service, more mobility, less delay, more safety out of how we operated what we already had. Maybe it's because I was getting older and I figured I wasn't going to live long enough to see the major highway improvements that my company was working on, they, most of which you know go on a 15-year time cycle from the time they go in planning to the time that they're complete. And I was thinking, yeah, I want to do something where I can see some payoff you know, in two or three years. And the whole arena of highway operations, traffic engineering, uh, incident management, freeway management, arterial operations, uh, uh, construction work zone, traffic management, um, incident management, th that whole cluster of activities, all of which are focused on, on getting more efficient use out of the existing system was the sort of, is the area that I focused on professionally in terms of doing studies, um, consulting to state DOTs and MPOs and local governments sometimes. And I gradually realized more and more that the problem wasn't sort of the technical stuff so much as the, the owner operators of the highway systems in particular, namely state DOTs that typically own the upper level systems in most states, they really weren't focusing on, on operating what they owned. They were focusing on adding new capacity by and large and the big burden of preserving and maintaining what they had already built in previous years. And so I realized more and more the problems were institutional. And meanwhile, there's all this new technology coming online in the ITS program over the last decade. And by and large, most states you know, had a bunch of ITS projects, and Galen presides over uh, a very uh, pretty elaborate array here uh, in, in Oregon. But here, as in most places, you know, it's a project here and a project there. It covers part of the system. Uh, despite the uh, aggressive efforts of Galen and the people who do what he does out in the districts and so on, you know, when you get up to the top level of a state DOT, and is it in the policy, is it in the mission, you know, how much money they're spending compared to other things, it all sort of disappears. So it's so operations and ITS and so on, I guess you could say the bottom line, this is sort of the thesis of what I'm going to talk about here with the slides, you know, is a fragmented activity that is supported by a lot of smart, uh, hard-working professionals, mostly in the middle levels of the DOTs, but it isn't really an institutionalized program that really tracks the top-level focus. You don't hear about it out in the community very much. You don't hear state legislators calling for more or change. You don't hear customers out on the road saying, why aren't you guys operating your roads better? I mean, people sort of accept the congestion and incidents and delay and so on without sort of like weather. They assume that that's the way it has to be. So that's a little bit of background of who I am and how I got here and what I'm going to talk about hopefully in the next um, half an hour or so. Um, and I guess the message that I have been uh, giving, if you will, is that state DOTs have to change in some pretty fundamental ways uh, and begin to think not just about, you know, what they're building, although that's, that has been and continues to be the dom the do building and preserving happens to be their dominant activities, construction 
and maintenance, but but increasingly on operating uh, the network that they have constructed and are responsible for. And there is a lot of technology that is out there, uh, usually applied in some other field and available to make to to do a lot more operationally uh, than we are doing. But the, but the DOTs themselves, as organizations, in terms of their mission, uh, uh, in terms of how they're organized in units, you know, divisions and between headquarters and, and uh, the districts, uh, in terms of how the how programs are funded and financed within the departments, they really haven't begun. They haven't really adjusted to the notion of hey, we should make operations a a, a principal focus. Um, and so the transformation that's needed, if we're really going to get, you know, uh, if we're really going to get with it in terms of operations and mobility services, to get away from this inherited legacy of of a public works entity, you know, a state uh, department that's principal job is to build stuff and to maintain it, and to into a state agency whose principal job is to provide. Uh, mobility service that can be measured uh, in a performance way. We can measure the performance. How much delay? What are the speeds? What's the delay? What's the reliability of the system from moment to moment? Peak periods, off-peak periods, weekdays, weekends, what have you. Uh, and there's, there's plenty of technology to help this happen. Measurable outcomes, in other words, and taking being accountable for performance. What does that mean? What does being accountable mean to me, what being accountable means is that as an institution, as a state organization, they're willing to they're willing to put up on their website, you know, how are we doing in the level of congestion, in delay, how quickly are we responding to incidents? Uh, if we don't have the state of the practice in technology defending why we don't have, you don't do ramp metering in Oregon, why not? I mean, they do it in other places. Well, we know the answers. I mean. Usually, oh, well, it's politically complicated and so on and so on. But, I mean, they're not out selling it, okay? And, by the way, when I say they, I have to keep saying, and, and, and Galen, you have to keep reminding me, I'm not talking about ODOT. I'm talking about DOTs in general. Uh, ODOT is way above average uh, in, in many of these uh, regards. Um, operations, just to, as a footnote, what, what do I mean when I use that term here? Operate systems operations and management, and every one of these words in this definition is is probably important. It's active management of the existing system to maintain customer focused performance. It means what what performance the customers want uh, in the face of congestion, incidents, and other disruptions to service. Getting all you can get out of the existing built infrastructure. Uh, and there are a whole set of operational concepts and ITS concepts, and those of you who are into ITS at all, you know about user services and stuff like that that express in various ways the things that you can do to get to main. You know, we build these traditionally in highway planning and engineering. We presume that they have a certain capacity. When we invest in them, we do a benefit cost analysis sometimes, and we presume that they're going to be delivering a certain amount of service. And then from the day they open, they deliver a degraded amount of service. They don't operate even at level service C. They operate at D and E in, in urban place. We don't build them assuming. We pretend that's not going to happen. We, we, we build them as though they were going to deliver level of service. We justify them by level of service C. They operate at D and E, and nobody pays any attention. And that's... You know, you could say that's professionally irresponsible, and of course, in a lot of in a lot of states, uh, uh, state DOTs will say, "Well, well, well, we're already doing this," uh, and I think the answer is to, or one way to answer the question is to distinguish between, you know, sort of the old style and the new style, if you will, or the, the way uh, people are doing it. Typically now, I call the 20th century style and what I'm calling the 21st century style here, and and. Uh, uh, I mean, let me ask Galen, since he's sitting here, and I didn't have a chance to do this previously. If I, is it true? Would you say that an ODOT that you have, what's the sort of coverage of, for example, detection and surveillance on the upper level highway systems in the major metropolitan areas? What percent of the upper level network actually has 
you know, cameras or loops actually on it. Probably around 70%, Steve, I would think, and, and it's primarily the Portland area. We don't have anything any, anywhere else, but here in Portland, probably about uh, some, somewhere in that, 70% of the interstate system has coverage. That's very good. Uh, now, what about the other, the other smaller cities? Zero percent. Zero percent. Well, I mean, in the state, so if you, if, if you applied some criteria by VC ratio or something like that, I don't know, maybe you've got 30 or 40 percent of the, or maybe more, maybe 50 or 60 percent. Um, we, are, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure on that measure, but we, you know, we do have, we do have some monitoring. I, you know, zero percent exaggeration. We don't have the kinds of things, you know, we have in the, in the Portland area, but there is, uh, you know, surveillance cover, coverage on a lot of the other freeway systems, and even some of the rural areas, more for operational purpose than necessarily incident management, but. Uh, or, or traveler information. So we do have some of that coverage as well as some other kinds of sensors around. But in terms of detection, uh, speed monitoring, that kind of thing. It's How about ramp metering? Ramp metering, pretty, pretty broad coverage mm -hmm. in Portland. Uh, forget the total number of, of meters. Rob, you, you may know better th those counts, but uh, most of the system covered. Excellent. And I, th you know, that's, I mean, so, you know, probably on this, gr on this slide, you know, Oregon may be, you know, moving down into the 21st century here uh, quite well, but, but certainly uh, this state is, is substantially above average in terms of the coverage that it has in terms of, you know, the top 75. For example, uh, FHWA, in looking at the top 75 uh, metropolitan areas, calculates at about, about a, on average, about a 25 percent coverage of the upper level freeway system with some form of detection and surveillance. That's after 10 years of, you know, being at it, and the trend line is, you know, kind of flat. I mean, I'll be dead before they get to 50 percent. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, it's that kind of concern uh, from a policy point of view that leads to, you know, the kind of statements that are, that are uh, uh, on the slide here. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, concepts and technologies that, that ramp metering is very controversial in some communities uh, because local governments are concerned about traffic backing up on arterial streets and so on. And there are, none of these applications are, <clears throat> are without issue, but as between widening a freeway or applying a ramp metering program in terms of the costs and the impacts, uh, I would suggest that in most environments that a ramp meeting program is a lot more viable and a hell of a lot more cost effective. There may be some circumstances where that's not the case. Yes, sir. Um, looks like we're talking mainly about the, you know, the responsibilities of the state agencies, transportation, but in terms of what happens, you know, at the local level, you know, if you have, for example, congestion and relief, you know, all that traffic is diverted to probably a lot of local streets, and then what's the responsibility of the local transportation yeah, most departments. Of, most of this presentation and discussion focuses on state DOTs because in most, but not all states, uh, the states own most of the upper level highway system that carries, you know, 50 percent or more of the total vehicle miles of travel. I don't know what the percent owned in, in uh, Oregon is. I mean, there's a range around the country. State, I, I live in Washington, I live in suburban uh, Washington, actually in the state of Virginia, and they own everything. Even the subdivision street in front of my house, I have shared drainage ditch with the state DOT. Uh, in other states, say like New Jersey, they don't own very much. Or in New York, the state owns a lot, but toll authorities own a lot. It's, state DOTs are very, very different around the country. They are not at all alike. Uh, and I'm not sufficiently familiar with Oregon to know, but most of what I'm saying here is probably also good, is to a large degree true of local government as well. Um, and, but, but don't lose a thought as we go along. There may be some specific issues that are. The, the one th other thing I want to say about the slide is that any, uh, any state DOT that's serious about operations has got to be serious about spending some real bucks. And I've looked around the country, and I don't find a st any state that's spending more than 
exclusive of snow removal. Snow removal. There's a lot of states where the, the what's invested in snow removal is greater than all the rest of the operational investment that they make in that state. So they have, well, I'll give you an example in, my, in Virginia, where we probably have maybe 10 or 12 days in suburban Washington part of Virginia where you got some serious snow, maybe 15. Uh, it, statewide, they spend 50 or 60 million dollars a year on snow removal. They don't spend that on the, all the ITS and ramp metering and incident management, freeway service patrol and so on added together. They don't spend 60 million a year. Um, so they spend more on those 20 days to preserve the operational capacity of the highway because it's very politically, politically exposed because it's so pervasive. Then they spend all the rest of the year on all the rest of the other kinds of delays that are caused by things other than ice and snow. And that's, of course, it depends from, it varies from state to state, but that's not untypical. Um, uh, why do we care? Care, why is operations itself so important from a mobility point of view? And this gets to the issue of recurring congestion versus non-recurring congestion in part. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about that from the point of view of this slide. Um, that you know, a lot of delay are caused by capacity shortfalls or geometric discontinuities uh, in the highway system, and we all experience that kind of stuff, the issues with weave and merv, merge friction and so on, and then at local government level and poor signal timing. Uh, and it, it is true that you can, uh, I mean, there are strategies to deal with each of those. You can build more capacity. Uh, you can reconstruct interchanges. You can add bits and pieces uh, to improve the geometrics uh, where there's weave and merge problems. Um, that stuff, dollar for dollar, is very capital intensive. And usually it means a little spot improvement. You, know, you can spend $100 million, $150 million, uh, on reconstructing a single interchange, uh, which might be, you know, six times the annual operations budget for the entire state DOT. So to get to deal with one bottleneck in one isolated location. It's very, very expensive. The point being that, that dealing with recurring congestion is capital intensive. And meanwhile, there's a whole lot of other kinds of congestion that are caused by breakdowns and crashes, uh, by delays at construction work zones, by the weather, which I discussed, even by vehicle mix in rural areas where you may have logging trucks. And I don't know if you've ever been stuck behind a logging truck for 45 minutes on a rural highway because there's no passing lanes, uh, for example, or special events that impose big traffic impacts. Those kinds, those kinds of things cause a whole lot of congestion, delay, and in fact, they're the principal source of the lack of reliability. You know, peak period congestion is more or less predictable. You know, you make the trip every day, and there's always going to be congestion in the rush hour, and you can sort of count on it. If you really want to avoid it, you can leave early or leave it. But what you can't deal with is that incident that happens, let's say, at the tail end of the peak, you thought it was going to, you thought you were going to be able to uh, uh, drive home. Uh, if you left at 6, maybe you were going to miss it, and there's some great big incident, and you have a 45-minute delay, what you thought was going to be a 20-minute trip, and you had no idea. Uh, for example, I have a, uh, I picked my kid up uh, from uh, daycare. It's a buck a minute for every minute after 6.15. Uh, sometimes I leave my office at, at 5.30, I can get to the daycare center in, in 15 minutes, a speed limit trip. But sometimes, and it happens about once every two or three weeks, what's a 15 minute trip turns into a 40 minute trip. A buck a minute, you know, I'm on the cell phone calling the place and saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to be there, you know, and there, so somebody stays with my kid and I pay a buck a minute. I have to sign a little piece of paper when I get there and that's, what I mean by un, you know unmanaged congestion, it's not congestion is not so bad, but it's an unreliability factor uh, that's an issue. What does that mean? It means when something happened, there was no response from the system. There was an incident. Yeah, and eventually they got around. You know, they got a vehicle out there. They did something. They got it off the. 
But I mean, it wasn't like somebody was waiting for that incident to happen, and they, or the incidents happened in the same place. You know, in where I live, probably 50 or 60 percent of incidents occur in the same, you know, mostly in the same places, and everybody knows where they are. If you listen to the radio, probably here in Portland, if you listen to the radio, they probably have a lot of incidents. It's always the same spot, and the guy in the plane's telling, "Oh, it's another, you know, back up at such and such and such and such." Well, you know, hey, you could preposition equipment out there. What, that's what I mean by the bottom half of this slide. Uh, there are those kinds of causes of a, of a reduced mobility, increased lack of uh, lack of reliability, and so on. And those are things that operations and management strategies, with a lot of ITS to support it, can really have an impact on. And it doesn't cost that much. In many cases, it has no cost, no capital cost, some staffing issues. I don't know how many freeway service patrol vehicles are there in the Portland area. Yeah, well, um, I believe there's 11, but usually on a typical like rush hour shift, there will be four to five vehicles on the road. Four or five. I mean, why not 15? Four to five, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, at this point, looking, uh, we, we just did a study looking at this, and looking at the number of incidents that happen versus the number of vehicles available, usually there's not more than four or five incidents happening simultaneously at any given point in time. And one, fortunately, one of those vehicles is right close by to, to be helpful. Well, you would, you would hope that would be, but they are, they are dispatched over the radio, and they, the incidents are able to be identified on the, on the camera network. So... Oftentimes when an incident is discovered, there can be a vehicle on the scene, you know, hopefully within five minutes or so. It's around the country when they're in the budget squeezes that have happened with a lot of states. Um, one of the first things to, got, to get cut in a lot of these state DOTs was freeway service patrol. Don't ask me why. I mean, there probably isn't a more cost-effective use of the taxpayer's money than freeway service patrol. Uh, but again, you don't have, you know, it's, I don't know that, what it's like in Portland, how much public support and visibility you have, and you get you know hundreds of postcards from everybody who gets uh, you know. If you do, I hope you do, and I hope you make sure people in upper management know about it in the newspapers and so on, uh, and a website that tells people about it. And do you calculate uh, what benefits you produce per year in terms of performance? Um. Yeah, well, this is one of the first studies that we've done this, and uh, it's difficult to to give sort of a precise number to what those benefits are because the you know the, re the the delay has already been reduced. You don't know how bad the delay would have been without the program in place. But the, our latest numbers to come out of this last study show that for the incident response vehicles to have a have a positive effect, they need to reduce the delay or reduce the duration of each delay causing incident by about 30 seconds, and it has a positive effect. Most, in most cases, they reduce the duration of the incident by much more than that. Right. Again, I mean, I think it's a good example. We're just beginning to get into thinking about how to measure the benefits of this kind of a program, and I think as more and more states do that, um, we'll find that we have a lot stronger support for the program, for bigger programs, if it's justified for spreading it out over uh, a, a wider piece of the network. Um, there's a lot of things that what I'm used the term operations in quotes uh, can do. Uh, some of them are obvious, like the efficiency of the v available capacity, improving traveler decisions, of course, by getting information to them through programs, and you have them out here. I forgot what you call it, but um, a, a, a uh, what is it called, Galen? The yeah, trip check program, right? 511 programs around the country. Um, there's technology that we talked about very briefly earlier this morning, the so-called VII program. I'll come back and talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later, but but allows, in effect, is introducing the potential for, it, in effect, eliminating runoff the road uh, accidents and intersection uh, collisions by providing real-time uh, information to to vehicle operators and to automated uh, control systems in the vehicles about the status of their vehicle relative to other vehicles or to 
the roadway itself in instant, almost instantaneous, I mean in microsecond real time, um, that the automobile manufacturers are really quite interested in. Of course, prioritizing, you know, preempt, you know, preemption, signal preemption for transit and emergency vehicles is another application of, of technology. Uh, traveler assurance services like May Day that GM uh, offers to respond to uh, uh, crashes. Um, electronic toll, electronic pricing uh, and billing systems to uh, to operate uh, toll roads and manage lanes of one sort or another. And there are a lot of things, in other words, that technology can do and that operations can do that have service impacts. And you could talk, you know, all morning about any one of these particular applications. And, and there are specific technologies or groups of technologies uh, that play a role here. And I just chose a a kind of a random set that are of interest to me. Um, the VII depends on a dedicated uh, sh short range communication system between vehicle and some kind of a roadside unit that can pick up uh, in a very low latency way, which is to say instantaneous uh, two way communication, uh, the location and speed of a vehicle uh, vis a vis a uh, GPS and map defined. Uh, highway right away so if that vehicle trends off the road there can be instant feedback to control systems on the vehicle to keep the vehicle on the road. The technology exists uh, but the imagine what's involved in, in, in implementing such a program first of all it has to be nationwide or you're not going to have the vehicle manufacturers put the little piece of technology in every vehicle that they need to put in. They're not going to do it if you're only doing it in one region. So you maybe have to four or five hundred thousand widgets, roadside units, to be deployed on the upper level highway system nationwide in some relatively discrete period of time if you're going to roll out this technology. Well, how, how do you organize to do that? Who organizes to do it? Does the federal government do it? Do they get the states together to do it? How do they interact with the uh, OEMs, the, the, the vehicle manufacturers? What role do the cellular communications uh, uh, industry play because there's a lot of communications that has to be supplied. It's a kind of a, it's a, it's a program that's under discussion in Washington with tremendous safety implications. I mean, something like reducing the fatality rate nationwide by 50 percent, maybe in three or four years, if we could just figure out not to figure out the technology, not the systems architecture, but how, who's going to pay for what, who's going to do what to who, how do you make it happen? And that's why, so a lot of these things come down to institutional issues. Even, even the bottom line here, um, uh, multi-sensor uh, embeds in road, uh, uh, in pavement that, that produce the usual weather-related information. I mean, temperature, moisture, salinity, um, uh, chain, uh, 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 amount of ice, and so on. Can all be read from a, you know, from a from a little uh, a, a multi-unit device embedded in the pavement and transmit to somebody exactly what the existing and and and, and dynamics are of, of localized weather that allows uh, snow and ice pre-treatment and post-treatment to be very carefully calibrated in a way to minimize delay and so on. It's a question though of of deploying those kinds of technologies, you know, in the roadbeds on all the affected facilities. There's an upfront capital cost and a tremendous payoff. Uh, so these, the technologies, automated enforcement, talk about speed, uh, speeding and speed control. I mean, we have the technology, obviously, for speed control on the freeway, but we have an institutional issue and a legal issue and a public acceptability issue and a privacy issue and all the stuff that has nothing to do with engineering and everything to do with lawyers and policymakers and politicians that keep us from capitalizing on the technology uh, that really allow us to get an operational grip uh, on the highway system. Um, some of these slides, um, are, you know, the print is so small that I've decided not to use them when I make these presentations. Um, and this one was just talking about some of the benefits that have been measured in some of the installations, and I won't discuss that particularly. This one, although it's fine print, uh, does make a point that I think is important, and it's that the, there's certain kinds of problems 
the solutions to which usually are a combination of a technology, an operational concept, and some new institutional arrangements. And you've got to have all three. The technology without the operational concept doesn't do anything, and even the technology and the operational concept may be good for a single application or a demonstration or a pilot program, but to really become something that system-wide requires that the owner-operator of the highway system decide that they're going to do that everywhere or in all the appropriate places and that they're going to staff it and that they're going to do, they're going to follow up, uh, they're going to do whatever kind of operational activity is implied uh, by that kind of technology or that there's in some cases it requires a special way of funding or bringing in about some new kind of arrangement between the public and the private sector. But anyway, the bottom line here is without going into detail because you could probably do a whole course about this, is that you know progress in our field, which to me is, usually, is equivalent to maintaining and improving mobility, nothing else, everything else is in third and fourth and fifth place, way, way behind. That's why we're in this field. It has to do with mobility. Otherwise, we might be in the environmental field or we should be in the some, you know, quality of life field, but we're transportation people. And if we're not making transportation better from year to year, why are we even here? And, you know, without grappling with this way in which you have to combine technology with concepts of operations with new institutional arrangements, nothing happens. And things aren't happening very fast because we're not doing a real good job at grappling, although there's good examples. And you have some right here uh, in your state that are good examples. And the question is how do we, you know, build from strength, you know, really drive that through. Um, generally, if you look around at state DOTs, you usually find that there isn't really a very clear commitment at the policy level to improving operations. And there may be some lip service to, you know, where you want to make, improve mobility and so on, but not in a way that's measurable, where the, where the chief executive officer of a department said, I'm committed to improving operations, and I'm going to have my department measure what's going on out on my system from hour to hour from day to day, from week to week, and we're going to see which way, that, is it, are the graphs going up or are they going down? And if they're going down, by golly, we're going to do something different until we find something that makes a difference. And if we can't, and if the thing that makes a difference is something that you, the legislature, doesn't like us to do, well, we'll come back and tell you. If you want to improve mobility, then we need the ability to do X, Y, and Z. In other words, to really confront through measuring performance what the institutions you know, what we're really trying to do is transportation institutions at state DOTs, as local uh, government transportation. Uh, right now, the kind of things I'm talking about are not a core program. They are, they are an activity, uh, some, sometimes quite fragmented uh, among different parts of state DOT. Some are maybe in traffic engineering, some in ITS, some in the safety, some in maintenance. Uh, freeway service patrol reports to to what in ODOT? Uh, it reports in the region, but I have the budget authority for it, so it's kind of come. Is it a mate? Is it what role does maintenance play, if any, in in it? Um, I, they work real closely with maintenance, but I, you know, there are instant responders that report directly to maintenance. But in terms of our dedicated service patrol program, they uh, are generally now organized. Uh, under our like our TOC, our operations center managers, right. So you got you got a lot of players with slightly different objectives. All, all. Not, this is not to mention the relationship, for example, with lo with law enforcement, both state and local, that are critical in operations and and the difficulties there because you've got different agencies. They have different objectives. Law enforcement people want to you know enforce law. Uh, they want to make sure that they're preserving life and property and so on. And so if they got to disrupt the traffic a little bit, well, I mean, that's, we're working around the country on that problem, but it's, but it is an issue. Um, and I've talked about some of these other, some of these other uh, issues. Well, I'll turn to one, I don't know anybody here has, has any interest in sort of in transportation planning per se, anybody, or shall I skip this a couple of people? I mean, one of the, one of the, ways in which you can tell that as an industry, as a profession, as institutions that we're not really focusing on operational stuff is if you look at 
the, how conventionally how transportation planning is done, and I don't know how much you, you know you probably all generally acquainted with travel forecasting and the four-step models and all this kind of stuff. If you've taken you know transportation planning 101, uh, but one of the things that's interesting about the process is it forecasts a future transportation environment where there are no operational problems. In other words, they look at they, they project traffic based on land use and demographic stuff, and they usually look at, and, and, and then the traffic assignment looks at what the peak period situation will be. A certain capacity and is, is, is assigned to a network, and a certain demand is forecast, which is, uh, which is forecast as a peak period. Uh, and then based on that analysis, you say, oh, over here, gee, there's a tremendous future demand and we're a shortfall in capacity. We need to add some more lanes or new facilities. They never look at, gee, in the future, just like today, there's also going to be, you know, incidents. There's also be crashes and breakdowns. And by not looking at that part of the future, when it comes time to use those kinds of future forecasts to determine what the expenditure should be in terms of the capital programming process that flows out of the planning, you know, the pl planning tends to, build, tends to lead towards um, building more capacity. Because it's only the capacity shortfalls, peak period capacity shortfalls that that kind of planning uh, addresses. So there's kind of half of the world of problems is simply ignored uh, altogether in that process. And it's been that way for 40 years since that process was first developed in the 60s. It really hasn't changed in its scope in 40 years. If you had, if you were, if you were a transportation planner, Rip Van Winkle, and you went to sleep about 1970, and you just woke up today, you'd find you could walk right into a transportation planning operation in a state DOT or an MPO and go right to work. You'd be instantly employable. I think, can you think of another field where that's true? I mean, that is a bit of a scandal. Um, Anyway, I'm just going to end here uh, by trying to characterize in a general way, you know, the sort of old-style DOTs and new-style DOTs or the old-style, you know, what system operator and owners, you know, have been doing up until now and where things are going uh, in the future. And I think, you know, the, 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 probably the top bullet is the most important one of all uh, is you know, if we start focusing on, on the performance of the existing system in terms of the outcomes that the investments or ac actions that we take have, measure the outcomes uh, as distinct from the outputs, not lane miles of added new capacity, but what the quality of service is, uh, that that alone will drive a lot of change uh, in, in technically and institutionally that probably needs to be driven if we're really going to kind of live up to the sort of fundamental presumption of our whole, you know, profession of being transportation planners uh, and engineers. And I'm going to uh, end it right there. I don't know how I'm doing on, on, on time. I'd be glad to, uh, to participate in discussion or try to respond to any questions or comments that anybody might have. Go ahead. I have a question. Um, are there any DOTs, I guess, outside of ODOT that you've seen make some progress towards your 21st century goals? There, I, I think recently. there's four or five that are uh, I would put with ODOT in the leadership posi position. Washington's pretty good. Maryland, Minnesota, parts of Texas. Uh, Florida's beginning to make some progress. I probably left uh, California. Um, is like several different states. I mean, it's real different. Depends on what part of California you talk about. Southern California is, is quite sophisticated. They have a lot of other problems in California that that make you know doing anything difficult. I mean, uh, uh, very very large and no money. It's a bad combination. Sir, um, I know that a lot of states have uh, excess capacity in rural areas and lack of capacity in urban in urban areas and but they're also dealing with a, a political um, interest in um,
alternative forms of transportation. And I think, I don't mean to speak incorrectly, but I can wash uh, Vancouver, British Columbia has kind of got the attitude, well, you're just not going to build anymore. You're going to just find other ways. And um, how, do, uh, how does your system politically deal with that question of, um, well, people don't want uh, to encourage more driving, which a more efficient system might allow more driving. Um, well, I mean, I you know there there's different politics in different places. I mean, it seems to me operating what, what you've already invested in in its most efficient fashion is just you know good public policy any time. Now, if it's I'm not and and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of system improvements that that are can that are probably important to make. I mean, one of the things about operating is you've got to have a manageable network to manage. If you have big discontin weird geometric discontinuities uh, in the system, you know, if you have four lanes into two someplace and things like that, I mean, no, you know, operational, you know, concept in the world can can deal with that. So you've got to have, you know, a decent basic a highway system to begin with. The issue of whether you're encouraging more people to, I mean, I don't think encouraging more people to drive is necessarily bad. I mean, usually if they're driving, they're meeting a need, uh, they want to do it because there's something that that trip uh, is achieving for them. Um, what they don't, what is really annoying is, you know, having a totally unreliable system that catches you off guard and requires you to leave a half an hour earlier than you otherwise would have to leave for all trips. Uh, because it is not, it isn't real. That so-called slack time, uh, excess time, that's very inefficient. Uh, but I mean, as far as whether more driving around is good or bad, I mean, cars are getting cleaner, safer, nicer. I don't think driving per se is is. I mean, that's a personal view. Okay. I mean, follow-up follow question on that. If um, in the for example, look, you're driving down the highway and you get some information through your onboard computer thing that tells you the highway up ahead is blocked to take alternative route. Um, or maybe at your home you haven't left yet. It right. says, don't go now, wait 10 minutes, it's, it'll be cleared up soon. Um, has there any thought been, been incorporated into a saying, hey, the interstate is blocked, we encourage you to take the, mat <laughs> the train right now because the train is actually running f faster? Well, oh, sure. I mean, I think that's, if, if the trip... If, if the trip that you're making is well served by some mode which is more reliable and just as fast or faster, why not? I mean, that would be rational. Uh, and, you know, you hear, I don't know around here, but in Washington, uh, uh, the transit agency has ads all the time about, you know, you're stuck on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Well, if you'd taken Metro, you know, you'd be there by now. And, of course, if Metro happened to go from where you want to go to where you, where you are to where you want to go, that's great. In my case, for example, where I live, I have to drive you know, sort of halfway to where I'm going just to get to a metro stop that doesn't have enough parking anyway. It's not convenient. I'm sort of, I'm forced to rely on the car, but I don't really mind. I mean, I organize my life to try and stay out of the peak period as much as possible, and the more people to do that, the better. And as we begin to get, you know, I only talked about, about operational management. As you begin to get into, into pricing concepts, which are clearly coming in the U.S., uh, then if you're really, for my daycare trip that where I'm paying a buck a minute for getting late, if they had a, you know, a priced lane that cost me a dollar a mile the way I-15 in San Diego costs you a buck a mile. And in the, after, in the afternoon rush hour, if you're driving into San Diego and you got an important appointment, you have your choice between, um, uh, between stop and go congestion going in or getting on the, on the HOT lane. And in the afternoon, I think it's 8.50 for the 10-mile trip, about a, bu about a buck a mile. For me, I'd save money uh, or daycare paying a dollar a mile. So I'd be, I wish they'd build, you know, premium guaranteed speed lanes. And I, in many cases, not every day, but a lot of the time, I'd, and there's, there's times when I'd be quite prepared to pay. Th that's coming as further down the line. I mean, s states that begin to build more toll roads get into pricing. You know, in the Northwest, where there is no tradition of tolls, that's much more politically controversial uh, for reasons that aren't necessarily rational. It's just a legacy of, you know, of where people's, you know, they argue that a lot of people think toll roads are going to have to stop at a toll barrier, or they think, 
toll roads or I'm going to pay twice for the same facility or something like that. I mean, all those arguments are have long since been dealt with in places where they're building toll. In Texas now, they've just got a huge new program to build toll. They're basically saying if you're a community in Texas and you want a new new highway capacity and you want it in the next 20 years, it's going to be a toll road. You can queue up to get in line for the scarce highway dollars that we have, but if you want it in the near future, then you need to support the facility as a toll road. And so they're building a lot of toll roads in Houston and Dallas and Austin. Yes, sir. You said that on a national level that um, DOTs are, a lot of them are pretty slow to implement some of these ITS and operational improvements. Um, is that is that due to like just sort of politics and just the general driving public not necessarily understanding the benefits of these operational improvements and really only understanding increased capacity? So is there? No, I think it's more it's it's more complicated than that. It's the whole culture of of the of highway departments the way in which those of us who have been or are parts of them view their our job our mission and the, how we project that mission out onto the legislature and the public and there is we have always thought of ourselves within highway departments as people who build and maintain roads principally roads and bridges and so on that's been our number one job uh, and we come out of a civil civil engineering culture focusing around that and the people that we have, the politicians that we have lunch with, or the stakeholders who are interested in what the department does, are people who are interested in, you know, build this thing over there, or build more, or, or project oriented. We don't get people making phone, hundreds of people making phone calls into our highway department saying, you know, gee, the level of service you're providing over here is not very good, and if you just, you know, cranked up, tuned up your ramp metering a little bit more, or if you had, you know, better surveillance and quicker incident response, you know, we don't care about the capacity. That isn't the way, that isn't the, that isn't the, way the culture works. We're, we're still in a culture of a public works entity, you know, where, where DOTs are thought of as construction companies principally by most people. Even in the legislature, how many jobs, I mean, this, you know, the highway funds are quite often sold as job you know, as producing jobs. There's not a very effective way to produce jobs. Building roads is really not a particularly effective way of building jobs. But that's the tradition. Um, how soon do you think um, somewhere in America will get the congestion pricing that's happening in London? And uh, where do you think it'll happen first? Well, we have we don't have area-wide congestion pricing. We do have a few experiments with you know time of day pricing on specific facilities like SR91 in Orange County and I-15 I mentioned earlier and a couple bridges and so on. I don't know. I've, certainly in Europe, there's there's a lot of interest in the UK and and elsewhere and a lot of declarations that they're going to replicate the system. Uh, there's talk in some cities around the U.S., but. It's going to take a pretty bold, I think, political leadership to bring that into being. I mean, we'll, if it's like everything else in our field, we'll have a decade or two of studies before some, you know, wacko politician someplace will try it out, and by by some lucky accident, it'll work, and then everybody will jump on the bandwagon. I mean, that's the way things tend to tend to happen a lot. I can just tell you that our company is is quite interested, and we formed an alliance with some some Brit experts in this and we're dying to find a client who at least will start out by studying it in a serious way. I mean, it clearly delivers benefits. And it happened in a, in a very politically opportunistic way in London. I mean, they, even though there have been studies for years, they just happened to have the right, you know, mad Ken Livingston, the mayor of London, you know, who's a real character. I mean, he just decided he was going to do it. And he had the political muscle to to uh, make it happen. You know, if it had been a long, drawn out study and so on, they probably would have found lots of reasons, you know, why it's, you know, not to do it. So, I guess it's something, one of those things that we need to focus on, and and we find a place to try it out, and to demonstrate, like a lot of other things, to demonstrate the the value, so people will have courage to to innovate.
it seems to me that to make transition to your 21st century goals, that the public's going to have to be aware. Who's going to inform the public if the DOTs don't really have an uh, incentive to do that? Well, uh, that's, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a conundrum. That's a dilemma that needs to be dealt with. I mean, in, we don't, you know, in the transportation sector, we don't communicate directly with our customers about the service that we're providing or not providing. We don't advertise. I mean, think about think about other sectors. I mean, you know, I must get either 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 on by TV or by mail. I must see two or three things a day about about cell phone service. Somebody trying to convince me to shift, you know, from one company to another, or telling me about what the great company is, or I get something in the mail about I wonder, you know, they communicate. Those people communicate with their customers. At least you get a bill. Uh, and we don't really, we don't get feedback from our customers in terms of how we're doing it in, any, in a regular way. I mean, transportation is not a market. It's a monopoly. It's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like this, it's the last Soviet, you know, public works system that we have. And there's no market, there's no prices. You can't go and buy another highway service from some other unit. You know, there's only, there's only the state DOT, and it's a, it's a one-size-fits-all service, right? I mean, there's no product, separate product lines. You can't, you know, if you, 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 you ride on the same highway in the same conditions, everybody else doesn't matter whether you're in a hurry or whether you're on vacation. Uh, if you think about it, I mean, it's very, very lame as a service concept. Everything else we're accustomed to be able to buy, you know, different types of service, more service, less premium service, special features. If we we expect to pay more in the in the peak, don't we? With our telephone service with our power, pay more in the peak. You pay less in the off peak. But in the highway sector, it's kind of we're kind of back in in a previous era, and especially in our. If you think about our society, you know, in American society that's built around the free enterprise system and markets and prices. In virtually everything we do, even in schools, you can go to a private school, you can get a voucher. If you're if you're willing to pay, and it's not it's very expensive, you can go to a different kind of school. You know, that's emphasized on the music school, a school for uh, kids that have special learning, you know, advantages or disadvantages, and so on. But when it comes to transport, comes to highway service. Don't, don't tell me about your problem or how much money you have or anything like that. We got one. It's it's like Bell Telephone before you guys were born. You got it's black, and you pick it up and they say information, please. You got no choice. Imagine to pick up my Rip Van Winkle uh, example I cited earlier. Imagine that you were a te a telephone engineer with Bell Telephone Company, and I'm talking when I got out of college, 1963. If I'd been a telephone engineer or I'd been a highway engineer trained, you know, bachelor's degree, okay, and I went to sleep for 40 years. I mean, when I got out of college, they had, you know, they had dial phones. And nothing was portable. Long distance was fabulously expensive. Uh, anyway, those two guys wake up in the year 2004, and that telephone engineer, they didn't even have anything called a telephone engineer anymore. I mean, that guy would have to go back to four or five years of schooling to find a job, whereas I've been a civil engineer in highway design, I could, I could walk into ODOT and get a job right away. I mean, that just gives you some sense of, of our sector is very, very uh, slow moving. It's not progressive. It's not innovative. And a lot of the reasons have to do, a lot of the reasons are because those of us who are in it are not pushing that hard. And we've cut the cord, the connection with customers, so our customers don't have very high expectations from us. And therefore, they don't hold us responsible particularly. I mean, suppose if you were a DOT secretary and if there's too much congestion, you know, people would rise up and say, you know, let's have new management in there. These guys aren't solving the problem. Let's get somebody in who can solve it. That's never happened in the history of U.S. transportation. No one's ever lost their job because of congestion. If you were the head of, of Singular or Verizon, 
And now you get this, you pick up your phone and there's no dial tone. You, you switch the next minute. That guy's lost his job in a week. The stock has plunged. You know, but we're in a world where there's, there isn't really accountability. So how can you expect progress? You know, why stick your, you know, why would you want to stick your head out? You were mentioning workforce-related issues. So you're sitting here at a university. We've got some high-powered DOT folks around here. Uh, what should the universities and the DOTs be doing together to help move in this direction? And then secondly, do you want to talk about any components of the federal transportation bills that might address some of these uh, issues? What should universities do? Well, I think part of it is, you know, one of the problems, this is an interesting problem, you think about it, as a, in the profession that presumably, I'll just say for the sake of it, that we're all in, right? We're, we're part of the transportation sector, or we're going to be, or we're studying to be, or maybe we're thinking about it, you know? And there certainly are, there, there are areas, there are places you can go where, that are more progressive than others. If I were in transportation uh, in school now, I'd definitely be in, probably in the in the ITS arena uh, because that's where the future is. But the institutional side uh, of of reinventing state DOTs as something that is more like the kind of institutions that supply power and water and telecommunications is probably where the future really lies and how that's going to happen is not entirely clear to me or to anybody else because you're talking about reforming a whole sector. If you think about how different the power, water, and telecommunications industries are and companies are today than they were, you know, when I was getting out of college. Completely different. Completely different. Uh, what drove them to change? You know, new, new service ideas, the ability to make money, by delivering on those new service ideas to lots and lots of people capitalizing on some pretty sexy technology. And there were a few entrepreneurs who took Bell Telephone Company on. They said, break a monopoly. It was a monopoly, like, like DOTs. Some guys, you know, brought so was lawyers and people who were going to make money, and therefore they were willing to work, you know, 18 hours a day, seven days a week to figure out a way to break up that monopoly and bring a new telecommunications concept into being. You know, where are those people in the transportation arena? Uh, you know, maybe that we have to begin to think about how to bring, how to privatize more and more of transportation services before you give people a motive to want to, want to really, you know, bust their butt to make something happen or to invest in it. I didn't really answer your question. As far as Washington goes, I mean, the principal thing that goes on in Washington is splitting a big pie. You know, in this case, it's something like $300 billion over six years. And Congress, the administration writes a bill that has some, some as far as operations go, has some important uh, innovations in it. And it begins to address some of the performance things that we've been talking about. Uh, it begins to spend some money on operational uh, improvements. Uh, it's, it continues to spend money on ITS research uh, and technology. It has some very important uh, pieces, but I can tell you that those things are like, you know, footnotes on the main action in Washington, which is we got a whole lot of federal money that, that a whole lot of congressmen are are trying to, you know, spread around to their states and their districts and fighting over, you know, how to do that. And the big issues are are the funding. And, and, and we don't want to raise taxes if we want to get for our state, for our congressional district, you know, as much as possible. And there's not a, a whole lot of thought being given to innovation. Uh, if you go to a congressional committee that talks about the transportation bill, they're not talking about service or technology or anything like that. They're talking about getting their piece of the pie. Uh, so what happens, the innovation part usually happens because the administration writes a bill and, and the, you know, people like us, you know, have ideas and we talk together 
uh, and we can try and convince the administration, this is U.S. DOT, that they should embody something in their legislative proposal. But it's not, the administration's bill is not the bill that's turned into legislation. It's the bill that's written by the House and the Senate, and they both write bills that come together in a conference, they compromise. The administration's bill they kind of use as a point of reference, and they pick some things out of it that make some sense. It depends somewhat on the individual leadership. But I don't think you should expect too much out of it. I guess that's the bottom line in terms of driving change. Any change that's going to be driven is going to be driven at the state and local level, you know, state by state probably. And you guys have, in this state, by the way, um, I mean, this is a pretty good state to, to be concerned with the kind of things that I've been talking about because there's a lot of things going on here. As I'm learning, just, you know, as Gail and his colleagues answer the questions, I mean, this is, this is a, a very promising place to begin a career in, in this area, I, I think. It's also a small enough state, so, you know, you don't get tied up in uh, a lot of the political knots that big states get tied up into. There's been a lot of talk about public-private partnerships over the last 15 years, uh, and um, I mean, how you get them involved is they have to have an opportunity to make money at a reasonable risk in a reasonably controlled way that's no worse than the other ways they can make money. And it's very difficult in partnership with transportation institutions to provide that situation because we move very slowly, we make decisions slowly, we're very conservative. Um, most of the things that the private sector has done where they've invested their own funds uh, has been in, you know, we have a couple of private toll roads. Uh, we, have a, we have a few uh, private companies that operate uh, traveler information services of one sort or another. And because of traditions and constraint, legal constraints that exist both federal and state, um, it's not a very promising, right now the context is not very promising for a private investor. Um, I'm, there's a lot of, this is something that's, that's is discussed quite a bit and there's legislation. I'll just give you one little example. Uh, take a private, suppose I wanted to, to do a private, my company developed a private toll road in Southern California, we just sold it. Uh, it took us 15 years about six or seven years longer than we had anticipated, as a result of which, you know, time is money. We didn't make nearly what we thought we were going to make. Um, the reasons were the, un the environmental clearance process is totally unpredictable and uncontrollable. You think it's going to cost you X to do the environmental clearance and it costs three X. Well, most investors are not going to take that kind of a risk unless the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is huge. Furthermore, for me to borrow money for a toll road, um, I have to borrow at market rates. If the state borrows money from a toll road, they can, they can borrow with the federal and state interest uh, tax-free. So I can't compete with the public sector. In the water sector and in the power sector, private entities uh, get tax relief if they're investing in a public facility, but in transportation, in highway transportation uniquely, private investors uh, don't get the tax relief that they get in other sectors. It's a, it's a stupid law, but just another example of how the landscape, the institutional landscape is not set up to support progress. It's called private activity bonds feature, and one of the administration's uh, proposals in the bill that they put up was was to uh, eliminate the restrictions on private activity bonds, but it's not clear that that's going to survive either the House or the Senate. Question over here. 
So we're talking about uh, congestion pricing. How can we convince uh, departments of transportation as well as the public that these are good ideas and, and that for the dots that the, the public would want such an object and the public why they'd want it? I think, I mean, the, when these things have happened, typically they have come through the political route. It usually has been, uh, and then I'll use the term, enlightened state legislators who have decided that something like that is worth doing or at least trying on a pilot basis and they have introduced legislation uh, to which the departments have responded and that's probably the you know the, the route to go the problem is of course that you know your typical state legislator doesn't know much about this and he doesn't learn about it from us in the transportation sector we don't have our DOTs going out to the legislature and saying, "Here, here's a whole bunch of things that you could really do that would make a big difference." It's a, it's 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 a vicious circle, you know, that 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 requires somebody, a champion, an innovative champion, to break out. Somebody has to raise the level of expectations in the legislature, so they'll come to the department and say, "You know, you will try this or you will do this." Uh, and if that isn't the department who goes out and raises their expectations, who is it? In some, in some fields, it's the profession. You know, in medicine, for example, organized doctors, not hospitals, not universities, but just doctors, medically, you know, the AMA, I mean, they come up with programs and they go to legislatures, and, and we don't do that in our profession. You know, our ITEs, our ITS Americas, uh, and so on, you know, don't constitute a political force uh, of any magnitude in in any state that I'm aware of. Not nearly the f political force that the road builder lobby constitutes. They got a lot of money to give to to legislative candidates, and they do. And and so that system perpetuates itself. That makes the DOTs think about well, our first priority is making sure that our construction program is well organized and well funded as best we can. So we don't get, you know, innovation doesn't have any professional constituency in most states that projects itself into the political arena. That's a problem. One of the, re why does it, why doesn't it? Because most of us don't have any economic or financial stakes in that innovation, whereas in other fields, people are promoting innovation, usually have a company that's going to uh, profit or they personally figure out you know it's in their interest that's the American way that's what capitalism is all about that's what markets economies are all about and we get progress through people who are gonna you know do well by doing good <laughs> nobody goes and lobbies a legislature for something that's going to impoverish them or not provide something that's interesting and exciting Um, there's been some talk here in the Portland area of uh, making some of our highways and interstates coming into the city center uh, toll roads. Um, and there's, you know, people argue that oh, you're taking away a, a public good or whatever. Um, is there an opportunity or an example of a, a partnership where a private uh, industry operates the road as a toll road, but then, you know, it's, it's, it's a government toll road, so the money goes back to the government rather than to, a, say, a private toll road? You mean it's just... The I mean, you're just talking about hiring a private company to operate a public toll road? Yeah, I guess, I guess so. What's and the advantage of that would be what? Well, the maintenance and operation would be Oh, a yeah, there's contracts for maintenance and operation. There, there are some departments that outsource significant chunks of their interstate maintenance and operation now in four states, including snow removal, uh, recovery from major structural damage from accidents, and all routine maintenance of highway structures and appurtenances totally outsourced on a performance contract basis Florida Missouri Virginia Texas I forgot what there's another state that's doing it you know four or five hundred miles and under one contract and they are they argue that there's there's a significant savings and a substantial improvement in the performance uh, plus uh, the DOTs can then take the staff people that used to do that and, and have them do something else that needs to be done because it's outsourced. One last question from Dan. Um, back to the private-public kind of thing. What about a bridge? Would the public pr 
private partnership to operate a toll bridge that was a non-freeway bridge. You're talking about cons building it and operating, or just operating it? You're about building it and operating it. Oh, yeah. It. Don't forget, in the rest of the world, most roads are toll roads. Big, most upper-level roads are toll roads. In the rest of the world, Latin America, Asia, y Europe, Africa, uh, most of the upper-level roads are toll roads, and most of them are built, and many of them are operated by private entities or quasi-private entities. U.S. is the only one that has this kind of weird, old-fashioned exception. I mean, we're the we're the oddball. You know, my company gets involved in you know in private toll roads, and, and other countries they, we do stuff there you can't do here. We're we're way behind in that particular area. We're way behind the rest of the world. The most experienced toll road operators and financiers are come from other countries. In fact, even the toll roads in the United States are being bought up by an Australian uh, company who knows more about how to finance and operate toll roads than anybody in the U.S.